Hey everyone, I am Steve from GamersNexus.net and today we're talking about the Zalman R1 case. This case is Zalman's first push back with a cluster of other cases. So this is the Zalman R1 and it is truly the height of case engineering incompetence. I firmly believe that this case has pushed the industry to new levels when it comes to design and in all of the wrong ways. Starting with the specs for the case and then we'll start talking about design flaws and hopefully other manufacturers can learn from this. The case has three fans. It's very simple. There's two exhaust, one in the back, one in the top, which is problematic, and then one in the front as intake. And these are all 120 millimeter fans. The one in the front has an LED, the back two do not, and that's really all there is to it in terms of cooling. There's very limited liquid cooler support, of course, as this is a after rebates $35 case. Before rebates, it's between 50 and 70, depending on which retailer you look at. It's about 50 right now on Newegg rebates, brands down to 35. Just for quick reference, other cases in that range would include the Corsair Spec 01, that's about $40. The NZXT Source 210, about $40. And then if you add 10 bucks, you get like the 200R and a whole range of very good cases. Silverstone's PS11B is, I believe, $40 or $45 also. So very fierce competition in that price range and the Zalman R1 is attempting to enter it. Starting with cooling on the case, we did some thermal benchmarks. You can see the charts now, and it's not the best case for cooling. This was tested against other 70-ish dollar cases, including the NZXT S340 and Antex P70, which is an identical chassis. It is the same as this chassis. They're OEM'd. Uh, the exterior is a bit different though, and that does impact cooling. So this thermal benchmark shows you that the R1 is not great at cooling, but more importantly, it's not great because of a lot of things like this top flap. And when you pull it up, first of all, it's not a great release mechanism, but when you do pull it up, you see that the plastic over the top mounted fan is covering the most critical parts of intake for really any fan. They're all pretty much the same. It's covering those air pathways for intake exhaust. So when you're trying to exchange the exhaust out the top of the case, it's running into plastic and then you have issues creating vortexes or looping the hot air in the case. And more obviously than this, if you leave the flap on, which is the only way the case has any semblance of looking somewhat okay, I guess would be the best way to describe it. If you leave it on, it is completely blocking the exhaust. The fan has nowhere to push the air when this thing's on. That's not entirely new to cases. Something like the Thor or the Throne do this by design, but they have a grill in the back of the case so that the exhaust still has somewhere to go. It doesn't just get circulated back into the CPU fan, which is sitting, of course, directly underneath this. If the rear exhaust isn't bad enough, the front intake fan is completely choked for air by this front panel. And this is a design feature in a lot of cases. I have a feeling it is less so for the Zalman R1. There's a little bit of room for the fan to breathe through this cheese grater mesh on the side. And this is also the only place you can see the blue LED from the fan that is completely obscured by the front panel. So they've elected to put an LED in a blocked fan. Very interesting choice, very good allocation of resources. And once you open the front panel, there's a few more problems. First of all, there is a dust filter here. That's an okay idea, but it's not gonna filter any dust because no air and with that dust can get through a solid piece of plastic. The solid piece of plastic, solid is a loose term here because it's actually, I don't know what the exact spec is, but probably about a millimeter thick. And the only reason this foam that you see on the front panel exists is not for sound damping, it's to make the front panel stronger. It is extremely flimsy by default, and this is just a the nature of very cheap plastic, very cheap manufacturing. It's a cheap product, but the Spec 01, the Source 210, all these other cases are substantially better, and that's really saying something for other competing $40 cases. So we can flex this really easily, which isn't great, and if you peel the foam off, which we'll show here, I'm guessing that there's an extremely limited amount of plastic for the panel and that it's really got no bulk to it. Moving to quality control and aesthetics issues, the top panel was installed off camber and is not flush with the chassis itself. As you can see by looking at the two screws as your landmark here in this shot, you can see it's not straight. So that's a major quality control issue and a severe design oversight. Speaking of design oversights, the side panel and the top panel 
are not adjacently, they're not aligned properly. When you look at the top panel, it sort of juts over the back. That's not a feature. That's, again, a design oversight. And if you look at any of the good cases on the market, including the Source 210, including the 200R, including the Spec 01, these are $40 cases, $50 cases in some instances, and they're not great, as no case at that price will be, but they at least get that right. They get the paneling and the alignment correct for the most part, and the quality control will allow that to, to persist in all the cases that are manufactured, more or less. The front panel, again, same issue, and even there are other small issues like the feet, which have no rubber padding. The Antec P70, if you recall, is the exact same chassis as this. Sam, some things we'll look at momentarily on the inside, but the exact same chassis. The footing on the P70 is different because they elected to install a different footing. It's rubberized, so it actually stays still on your surface if you have it on a solid table. And you can see as we're moving around this shot here, the, the case is very prone to sliding and it's a bit, uh, it makes me a bit uneasy as a user or as a system builder. Other issues with the paneling and quality control would include a cross-threaded screw on the bottom here. This is uh, not installed flush and you can see that just maybe barely in this camera shot. The metal paneling on the chassis at the top is dinged. It's not severe, but at this angle, really at most angles, you can see the light reflecting off of the dents in the paneling that is on the outside of the chassis. So another issue for quality control. And then installing the side panel alone is difficult enough because you have issues getting it flush to the front, flush to the top, and then screwed in through the holes, one of which is cross-threaded. So we've just got issues all around. Finally, on exterior design flaws, the plexiglass or uh, cheap plastic paneling here, I, I guess it's really just a cheap clear plastic. If we push on the corner just a little bit, it will slide inward on the rail that's holding it in place. And I really shouldn't have to explain why this is a design flaw. I'm sure you can quite reasonably on your own draw those conclusions, but uh, it definitely is, is not how it should have shipped. The upside to this glass window, despite its flexing nature, is that you can see the floppy drive bay from certain angles. So we've just got issues all around with the paneling and the outside of the case, and we're not even to the inside of the case yet. It's one of the more technical items worth complaining about would be the fan controller. When we use the fan controller, it has a max, a low, and I think that's really it for the settings. There might be an off, but when you use the max setting, it doesn't get a stable 12 volt to the fan. And if we plug a multimeter in there, you'll see it sort of fluctuates just below the 12 volt range. This fluctuation can cause fluctuations in RPM, which impacts thermal testing, impacts thermal results in the real world. And this is an issue. It's not something I expect anyone to really bypass in a cheap product like this, but at that point, why are you including a fan controller is really the, the only thing I get out of it because you're better off plugging into the motherboard at that point or using some aftermarket controller that's much better. Moving to the inside of the case, we see the same chassis that is used in Antex P70, and I first want to introduce you to the floppy drive bay. This is something we haven't seen in a while. It is on the Zalman R1, so that is a major plus for legacy systems, I suppose. And the floppy drive rails come bent in the system. That was a feature added to it that we encountered. And the bending is not too bad because you can actually bend it back, just like sprue and modeling or miniatures or figurine uh, cutouts. So you can bend it back. Don't bend it too far because it will snap. But that is the floppy drive bay. Don't want to spend too much time there because there are many other things to worry about, like the random drilled holes in the motherboard tray that will do absolutely nothing for anything, including cooling. And behind the motherboard tray, very limited space for cable management. You'll be doing most of your cable management in the case proper. And moving on to issues that are perhaps even more noticeable to the end user. I had difficulty, by which I mean it was impossible to thread screws through the expansion slots for the video card. We ended up just tethering the, the video card to the case itself by using a zip tie. The opposing side of the case from the unthreadable video card expansion slots we have the SSD bay. This is a special bay that was installed on the top of the 3.5 inch base. So this is actually foresight. I'm glad that it's here. For a full list of grievances on the Zalman R1, check the article linked in the description below. Patrick Lathan, our reviewer, has already talked about all of them. He did a case roundup looking at this one, the Antec P70 and the S340. The reason for those three cases is because at the time of starting the roundup, they were all about $70. 60 to 70. Now this one's got the MIR rebate for 
uh, down to $35. And even at this price point, I have a very difficult time arguing in favor of the R1. It is at the point where it's, it's so poorly designed and so bad that I would really strongly encourage everybody to spend an extra $5 and get almost any other case. And you don't even have to spend an extra $5. The Source 210 bounces between $35 and $40 pretty regularly. The Corsair 100R is about $50, to be fair, but it is the same chassis as the Spec Series cases, which did better in Asia than in the US. And the Spec Series cases are perfectly fine for a budget build, about $40 as well. And the Silverstone PS11B, which is the same as the 100R, is $35, $40. So there's a lot of options out there to replace this and they're all better designed. They have more functional uses that make better sense. And most importantly, the quality control in our experience with them is just a lot better. And we've got videos of those on the channel from CES. So that is the Zalman R1. This is Zalman's return to market. I wish it were stronger, but it is not. It's simply not a case I can recommend right now. All the others are better options. If you like this content, please like, comment, subscribe as always. Check out our new Patreon page. You can hit that link after this video. And that's a new campaign we're starting out to help uh, move forward with better lighting, better camera equipment, all that. So again, link in the description below for the full review, and I will see you all next time.